Uh, it's, it's a busy day, so we have members, uh, I guess almost every committee is meeting hearing on lots and lots of bills, so it is a busy day. I did want to announce just for the people that are here uh, to, uh, to be heard or to comment on item number nine, AB 1360, uh, the Charter Party Carriers Bill, that, that bill has been pulled. It will not be heard today. And the rest of the bills, we're going to begin right now by establishing a subcommittee on the Committee on Energy, Utilities, and Communications. And we'll begin with uh, item number one, AB 693. Our, the author, Eggman, is here. Welcome, Assemblywoman. Begin when you're ready. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here before you today with this bill on this day. I present to you AB 693, which will establish the solar care program to provide for low income tenants of affordable housing the ability to benefit from solar systems. In the past, California has attempted to provide solar systems for low income renters. However, none of these programs have tackled it head on. And we think, we think this does. Uh, in fact, we have Randall Simmons here with us. Uh, from the MASH Coalition here today to discuss why solar care is needed even after programs like MASH exist, which was the, uh, one of the first, more first iterations of, of doing this. So unlike past programs, solar care will bring overdue direct economic benefits to low-income Californians. Specifically, solar care will be primarily used to offset tenant load. For too long, districts like mine have awaited to be part of California's green energy revolution and this bill changes this by fully subsidizing solar roof installations for low-income people living in multi-housing affordable projects. With these solar systems installations, low-income tenants will receive offsets to their electricity loads, which will provide reductions to their electric, electri electricity bills. Apart from the economic benefits provided to low-income renters, solar care will also relieve pressure from our care program, as many of the individuals participating in solar care will most likely also be care participants. Furthermore, AB 693 reduces the state's greenhouse gas emissions, provides local jobs to our communities with the requirement that the commission establish local hiring requirements, and for the first time in many communities, bring the solar revolution home. Uh, in advance, I respectfully ask for your I vote, and we do have witnesses here in support. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Wesso and committee members. My name is Strella Servas with the California Environmental Justice Alliance. We represent over 20,000 community members across the state who are mostly low-income communities of color. We have members from Barrio Logan, Chula Vista, National City in San Diego, uh, low-income communities in Riverside and San Bernardino, Southeast LA, Wilmington, Central Valley, Oakland, Richmond, Oxnard, Fresno, Coachella, and poor parts of San Francisco. These are all environmental justice communities. CEJA has made uh, AB 693 a priority bill for four reasons. Number one, AB 693 can help close uh, what we call the green divide in California. Low-income communities of color across the state are primarily renters rather than homeowners and have not had the same opportunity as higher income areas to participate in the renewable energy revolution. Uh, for example, Barrio Logan, a low-income community of color adjacent to an industrial pollution at the Port of San Diego has only about one-third of the solar installations that more affluent neighborhoods of La Jolla and Rancho Bernardo each have. AB 693 helps close this solar divide by giving low-income renters and disadvantaged communities an opportunity to directly benefit from solar power on the rooftops of multifamily affordable housing. In Senate District 40 alone, there are 160 multifamily properties with 15,000 low-income rental units that would be eligible for solar care and has the potential to invest $46.5 million in that district. Uh, number two, AB 693 will reduce our energy bills in low-income communities. Currently, low-income households in multifamily buildings spend one-third of their income on utility bills, while average California households spend less than 5% of income on utilities. AB 693 helps lower energy bills for low-income families with solar energy that will result in $46 million of savings to tenants over the system life. 
Number three, AB 693 can help reduce pollution and fight climate change in highly impacted areas. Low-income communities of color have some of the highest rates of pollution, unemployment and underemployment, poverty and asthma in the state, as well as some of the oldest um, infrastructure and the fewest clean energy installations. The communities that are also hardest hit by climate change lack the resources to adapt. And AB 693 helps shift from dirty energy to clean energy in these low-income communities. And number four, AB 693 can create local jobs. Unemployment and underemployment is the highest in areas such as Barrio Logan, National City, Imperial Beach, and El Cajon. And uh, AB 693 creates local green jobs by requiring the California Public Utilities Commission to establish local hiring requirements for the program to provide economic development in disadvantaged communities. Even with existing renewable energy programs for low-income and disadvantaged communities, there has only been less than 1% penetration into disadvantaged communities. AB 693 is a needed and critical step to finally get renewable energy into these communities that many of your constituents are clamoring for. And for all these reasons, um, Seha strongly urges your I vote. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Hueso. And Committee members, my name is Randall Simran, and I am the Executive Director of Community Advancement and Development Corporation, a member of the MASH Coalition. The MASH Coalition is a group of 18 nonprofit and for-profit affordable housing organizations that have made commitments to install renewable energy to systems on affordable housing properties that have joined and that have joined together in the MASH proceedings to support policies that provide greater access to solar within this underserved market. To date, organizations in the coalition have installed over 12 megawatts, an another have an additional 28 megawatts of planned installations. I'm here today on behalf of the MASH Coalition to strongly encourage you to support AB 693, which in our view provides a breakthrough for expending solar benefits to low-income rent. Number one, AB 693 closes a gap in current solar programs. The growth in solar, the growth in solar in California's residential markets facilitated by the California Solar Initiative has largely bypassed low-income renters and disadvantaged communities in California. In California, there are over 5 million households eligible for the CARE program, and according to the 2013 Needs Assessment for Energy Savings Assistance and the California Alternate Rate for Energy programs, 64% of CARE-eligible low-income households reside in rental housing. To date, the MASH program has served less than 6,500 low-income renters. An analysis by the Center for American Progress reported that only 4.2% of the solar installations under the California Solar Initiative served households with incomes of less than 40,000 per year. AB 693 would address this deficit by providing low-income renters access to direct economic benefits delivered by solar systems and by extending the benefits of California solar vision to disadvantaged communities and underserved markets. Number two, AB 693 scales solar in underserved markets. Current solar programs have not penetrated the affordable housing markets. We estimate that there are over 8,000 properties with nearly 1 million units serving households with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level that could reach AB 693. AB 693 would install a combined genera generating capacity of over 300 megawatts of solar in markets not adequately served by California's solar programs and policies. AB 693 would reach over 200,000 low-income renters at approximately 2,500 sites. By contrast, in that seven or eight years MASH has been in place, we have reached only 300 properties and 6,500 low-income units. The reach of solar care would be a game-changer for low-income families in California. AB 693 tenant first strategy would achieve parity for low income renter. Split incentives requiring property owners to subsidize the cost of energy improvements that benefit tenants, but, but not the properties have been 
large barrier to scaling solar systems to serve tenants. Generally, the margin available from net operating income at affordable housing properties is very thin, permitting enough to preserve the house housing asset, but not enough receipts to cover major investments like solar or the funding gaps after solar rebates are factored in. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Did you want to speak in favor of the bill as well? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, briefly. Uh, okay. Uh, and did we have anybody else from the public that wanted to speak in favor? Is that line on the side, the support line? Just to get an idea in terms of, do we have uh, members of the audience that'd like to speak against the bill? Anybody opposed to this measure? Just, I want to see some hands, anybody opposed? Okay, so we have overwhelming, you, you're, you're speaking opposed? Okay, uh, maybe if you can, we have two speakers speaking opposed. If everyone else, after you make your comments, can just state your, 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 who you are, uh, who you're representing, if anyone at all, and uh, your position on the bill. Uh, as brief as you can. Yes, very, very briefly. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Wayson and committee members. My name is Wayne Wade. I'm the Vice President of uh, Public Policy with Everyday Energy. Uh, before joining Everyday Energy, I was the Regional Energy and Climate Manager for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a position that I retired from last October after 35 years of public service. In that position, I work with affordable housing providers in California and other states to advance policies to address split incentive barriers to reaching low-income uh, tenants and providing renewable energy systems. I'm here today in support of the testimony provided by SEHA and the uh, MASH Coalition and to assist in answering technical questions with respect to uh, extending renewable energy benefits to low-income renters. Thank you. Eddie Moreno on behalf of Sierra Club California and support Kelly Dan on behalf of California League Conservation Voters and strong support. Alberto Tarico on behalf of Sunrun in support of the bill. Margaret Gladstein on behalf of Solar City in support. Amy Van Walker representing Environmental Health Coalition, Communities for a Better Environment, Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, and Physicians for Social Responsibility LA in strong support. Will Gonzalez on behalf of the California Solar Energy Industry Association in strong support. Juan Altamidano with Audubon, California, in strong support. Scott Sarum with Everyday Energy, in strong support. Morgan Carvajal with the Hernandez Strategy Group on behalf of the Utility Reform Network. We're working with the author's office on a few concerns, but overall support the concept. Karina Hendren on behalf of Environment California, in support. Who else do we have? If you can clear the space so we can have the, the opponents come forward. And, and speak on the measure. Yeah, if you could come close. Okay, whatever you want to, whatever you want to say. Support, oppose, whatever. On. Mr. Chair, members. Mr. Chair, members. Cindy Howe with Southern California Edison, and we are not opposed to the bill. We. Um, we, and we have not opposed an extension of the, of the MASH program, um, which uh, there was an extension of actually SASH and, um, and MASH in 2013, and we were involved collaboratively with the Public Utilities Commission to extend that program. And during, um, during the CPC proceeding, extend, extending the program, there were uh, lots of different policy issues that came up that were worked, um, worked through. And uh, despite the fact that that proceeding just concluded in, in January, and our, our concern is that AB 693 would attempt to recreate the program under a different name with very similar characteristics and um, with reversing some of those poli policy decisions that were just arrived at. Um, a couple of the issues are related to program administration um, and um, and which basically means who is best uh, best situated to administer the program, and there was significant discussion and and debate on that issue at the CPUC. So the decision is six months old. I, I think that um, Southern California Edison is interested in engaging and will continue to engage with, with the author's office in trying to look at the programs that currently exist and figure out how to get to the, uh, the goals the author wishes to achieve, but are concerned that 
that there are um, still significant issues that are unresolved with regard to the legislation that we look forward to continuing work. So thank you. Valerie Terrell of Lajos with PG&E, um, associate myself with the previous comments and we're um, happy to continue to work um, with the author closely to achieve the same objectives. Okay, if I can ask the author, how's that going in terms of? It's going well, we're committed to continue to work. We've, uh, we are working. Okay, the, at least it sounded positive. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. Israel Salas with San Diego Gas and Electric also do not have a position at the moment. Uh, thank the author for bringing the issue forward. Uh, the concerns that we would like uh, the committee just to consider, and we're happy, happy to work with the author going forward, are we want to make sure that the program meets the requirements of AB 327 in recognition of the significant efforts that are currently underway at the PUC, and that SDG&E should be allowed to administer the program because we are already providing such programs and would provide the best administration uh, due to our experience and relationship with our customers. And we also would like the, the use of the currently proposed funding source for AB 693, uh, that it should be mo moderated to make sure that the funds are available for other programs that could benefit disadvantaged communities. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Did you want to close? Do we have anybody from the committee? Uh, now is the committee member time to weigh in. Mr. McGuire, did you want to say anything on this? Okay. Checking. Uh, I just want to make clear that uh, the committee proposed some amendments and that you're okay with those amendments? Yes. That when we move the bill that it would be uh, moving the bill with the amendments. Is that clear? That's clear. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Did you want to close? Uh, I'll just say thank you very much. We're, we're very excited. We've been working on this uh, for quite a while now, bringing together the solar industry, the community, uh, uh, environmental justice agencies, apartment owners, and saying how do we actually crack this divide. Um, and I'll say that the funding we're talking about currently is already set aside, uh, and it is barely being used at all. So there's, there's uh, plenty of money to be able to implement this, we think, very important program. Respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. And when, when, uh, when we have a quorum, I'll ask for for the, your bill to be moved. And thank you very much, great presentation. We're gonna hear from, uh, we have a assembly member in the room, uh, assembly member Bloom on uh, AB 1330. And while we were we left off talking about amendments, if you want to address the committee amendments that were proposed, if you if you accept the amendments, well, we saw those as suggestions uh, for further work on the, on the bill. Um, there were two, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, one relating to uh, uh, cost effectiveness, um, and uh, we wanted to. Uh, Make sure that the um, there, there's an, an off ramp that is in the bill, and we thought that that addressed that issue. And then underscoring the uh, uh, importance of demand response, I think our witnesses. That's witnesses the only amendment that. that we okay. we put forward. I don't know well, the other Mr. ones Schiller that you to speak to that issue. Um, for the uh, uh, bill in chief, uh, Mr. Chair and members, thank you. Uh, energy efficiency is the first call of the state's loading order before procurement of renewable energy and conventional power. And of course, it is also the cheapest source of power that we have because every megawatt that's conserved is one that doesn't have to be purchased later. However, energy conservation, much like water conservation, is also arguably one of our most overlooked resources. Unlike renewable energy, there is no tangible bar set for achievement. And Unlike conventional power, the default position is not that we will purchase it at any price. And as a result, energy efficiency, which is largely on the demand side of the meter, has not been meaningfully factored into the state's long-term energy planning process at this point. And this bill would change that. AB 1330 sets a conservative but tangible goal for achievement of energy efficiency in the state. That goal is at least 1.5% of the total retail sales of electricity for each utility subject to this bill by 2020 and at least 2% by 2025. And the goal is at least three quarters of a percent of total gas retail sales for each utility subject to this bill by 2020 and at least 1% by 2025 for the gas industry. 
This goal is inclusive of what the utilities already do in the ratepayer funded programs. And through these programs, the IOUs cumulatively already achieve 1.5% in load savings. However, having a tangible goal will create accountability for those programs. It also makes those achievements more countable for the state's long-term planning so that investments in those programs actually result in less power being purchased. 95% of current energy efficiency expenditures are allocated towards current building stock. So this goal not only dovetails nicely with what the governor proposed in his State of the State address, but it is also an essential component for all of us if we are serious about doubling energy efficiency in existing buildings by 2030. Even though energy efficiency is undeniably the cheapest resource when compared to power purchases, this bill enables the PUC to exercise a cost off-ramp and halt energy efficiency expenditures before reaching the target if efficiency member measures are not cost effective. And lastly, this bill ensures that disadvantaged communities be given the highest priority for the benefits, including energy savings achieved in activities undertaken utilizing ratepayer funds. And that's why groups such as La Cooperative Campesina de California, Teleku, uh, who works uh, 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 with uh, numerous community-based organizations around the state to provide quality of life services for low-income communities, and the Energy Efficiency Council, a nonprofit trade organization of consultants and specialty contractors who provide energy efficiency education and installation services statewide for low to moderate income ratepayers. All of these groups support the bill. In the opposition testimony today, you may hear that utilities need flexibility rather than mandates, or that this bill places a prescriptive constraint on utilities. However, please bear in mind that uh, utilities currently receive $1 billion in ratepayer uh, funds for energy efficiency programs. And this bill requires that system to achieve a conservative savings goal that translates into fewer power purchases for the state. In short, this bill proposes a tangible work product for ratepayers investment and is no more restrictive than the goal setting process at the PUC that the utilities laud. You will also hear that this bill does not address the institutional challenges or market barriers that are placed upon them by the PUC. However, this issue is addressed by AB 802 that is also before this committee. And as the committee's analysis points out on that bill, simply allowing utilities to include below code projects to be included, could, and this is a quote uh, from the staff report, could displace above code projects that would have provided truly additional energy savings. If we are truly serious about doubling the energy efficiency in our existing buildings, and we should be, it must also be done with real investments in building upgrades and utilizing technological advances, not simply changes to how we calculate our savings. I have with me today Steve Schiller with the California Energy Efficiency uh, Industry Council who wishes to speak in support and answer any questions that the committee may have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Tiffany Whiten on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Industry Council. Um, we are the sponsors of the bill and we thank the author for bringing this bill forward. The Energy Efficiency Industry Council is a 70 plus member trade association that provides energy efficiency services and products around the state and employs thousands of Californians. AB 1330 establishes an energy efficiency resource standard that is critical to meeting the governor's overarching climate goals, as well as makes the grid more reliable by bringing greater certainty to planners regarding minimum level of efficiency to expect every year. Though broad targets have been set, there currently are no specific requirements that would drive, the, drive and ensure the adoption of demand side energy resources such as energy efficiency and demand response. AB 1330 will do just that. By setting an achievable goal as the floor, AB 1330 will move the state beyond its current level of achievable energy savings through energy efficiency and demand response and would save more than $10 billion in utility bills over the period 2015 through 2030. Um, we thank the author again for bringing this forward. And again, we have Steve Schiller here to answer any technical questions and we urge your support. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, first, I want to answer the question you had concerning the amendment around demand response about uh, removing the uh, provision specifically around limiting to event-based, and short answer is yes. We look forward to working uh, with the author and the committee uh, and uh, staff to you know, come up with the appropriate language. Uh, we've read the uh, concerns uh, from some of the uh, per opponents and proponents and talked with them, and we uh, would like to uh, take up the suggestion indicated. Uh, my comments, I want to cover a couple of the items that have been uh, addressed in uh, the bill. Uh, but let me start by saying efficiency is the first mentioned, but it's also the first forgotten. California lacks a definitive goal for what is arguably the most cost-effective way to reduce Californians' energy bills, provide reliability, provide jobs, and reduce our greenhouse gas footprint energy efficiency. In terms of goal setting, AB 1330 is based on the performance and potential of our state, as well, documenting a number of public studies, as well as the performance in other states. With respect to the potential studies, there's a huge difference between what has been determined to be economically uh, viable versus what the utilities and the agencies are assuming, in part based on what's uh, been the policies of the past. So what this bill looks to do is close the gap between what is economically viable in the state and what this, these utilities and agencies are assuming is uh, achievable. I brought a quick little picture show here. This is a graph going out over time done by the P Public Utilities Commission. The numbers up here, lines up here, are what is shown to be economically viable, but the lines down here are what are shown to be actually be achievable. The bill talks about separating, excuse me, you know, decreasing this gap here, and that's what it's all about. And I have copies of this from the Public Utilities Commission report for electricity and natural gas. Um, now, on average, we currently achieve about 1% of electricity savings from efficiency in our state, about half of that for natural gas. Some utilities do better, some do worse. AB 1330 moves up this floor to 2% for electricity in 10 years and about 1% for, natu for natural gas in the 10-year time period. Among other benefits uh, this puts into code is a quantified and simplified way of meeting the governor's objective of doubling efficiency in our buildings. Let me be clear that other states are currently meeting this 1330 goal. If Massachusetts is meeting the AB 1330 2025 target today, why cannot California, which has historically been a leader in efficiency, achieve this within 10 years? This bill provides the incentive for that, the push for our agencies and utilities more rigorously document and report the results of their uh, utility customers' investments. It does not tell the market, the utilities, the agencies how they must do it. It provides the flexibility, but does that with accountability. Instead, statutory goals create certainty. We can count on efficiency as a resource in the state, and this provides benefits for workers and consumers. For, the, for jobs, efficiency provides good local jobs. The number of efficiency jobs exceeds the number of people working in any other energy field in the state. You can find this in every county of the state. A 2015 survey found over 300,000 people working in efficiency-related jobs in California. Doubling efficiency means more jobs. But also, I think more importantly, is that every consumer in California can benefit from efficiency. Per perhaps most importantly, disadvantaged uh, communities, low-income residents can, can and should receive the full benefits of efficiency investments. Thus, this bill does set some direction indicating a priority for our disadvantaged communities to ensure they are not left out of the opportunities that come from these programs. We're looking that everyone in the state can benefit from this. In closing, I just want to respond to two points that have been raised on the cost effectiveness. As Assemblymember Bloom has pointed out, there is an off-ramp in the uh, version of the bill, current version of the bill. And secondly, there's comments being made about holding entities accountable for induced behavior. This is not new. Water agencies are required to reduce urban water use by 25 percent. School districts are held responsible for the performance of their students. And even utilities are held accountable for meeting whatever other requirements of their customers. What is different is that there's a billion dollars of money coming from these utility customers, from the investor-owned utilities, and what we're doing is holding them accountable. So in conclusion, the alternative to more efficiency is not the same or less efficiency. It is wasting energy, having Californians pay more for their energy, losing job opportunities to other states, and allowing um, you know, California to not fully realize its energy efficiency potential. So with that, I urge your support, and thank you very much. Eddie Moreno on behalf of Sierra Club California in support. Corey Bolas on behalf of Environmental Defense Fund also in support. Hi, Alex Morris with the California Energy Storage Alliance. We also support. 
Sylvia Solis Shaw on behalf of Advanced Energy Economy and Strong Support. Melanie Gillette on behalf of Enernox, Strong Support. Good afternoon, Senators. Lori Kammer, Small Business California and Strong Support. Haley Goodson on behalf of TURN, we support this bill with one lingering concern that we're continuing to work with the author on. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Mario DiBernardo from the Northern California Power Agency. We represent 15 local publicly owned utilities throughout the state. We are in strong opposition to this bill. Uh, Public Power releases an annual report on energy efficiency every year. We, we take this report very seriously. In it are a number of policy considerations. This bill ignores those policy considerations and actually does the opposite. Among the recommendations is that um, there, there be a serious look taken at the regulatory programs that currently prevent uh, energy efficiency. We have AB 802 before the committee today that helps address it, where the PUC has put in measures that, that prevent energy efficiency. Um, there are issues with codes and standards where, for example, they require whole building retrofits if you go over a certain percentage of, of lighting changes, which then prevents people from um, installing uh, energy efficiency lighting because they don't want to bear the uh, extra costs. Um, then it also focuses on customer motivation. There are reports of programs that give uh, no cost incentives for energy efficiency measures and there's low participation. And so there needs to be a serious examination of what motivates the customer uh, and ultimately the customer is responsible for, for implementing the energy efficiency measures, not the utility. This bill instead puts all of the responsibility on the utility to ensure that those energy efficiency measures are taking place. Um, there are also other programs in the state to reach the state's uh, energy efficiency goal with Prop 39 and um, um, codes and standards, et cetera. We think that uh, an alternative approach would be to look at all of those programs and, and as well as utilities to determine how we're going to reach the, um, the goals of doubling energy efficiency in existing buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gil Topete with the California Municipal Utilities Association. I have about uh, 15 of NCPA's members in my organization as well. And we are here to oppose AB 1330 uh, for the following reasons. Primarily, when you set the goal of 1.5% by 2020 and then 2% by 2025, numerically that sounds like a small number. But for m m uh, many of my members, reaching about 0.5% to 1% is considered aggressive at 1%. So already for the members who can re reach it, it's 1%. So effectively taking it to 1.5% as a hard mandate, that's a 100% increase for many of my members. These are voluntary programs. I, I cannot force, unless either by this statute or some other process, you want to compel the utility to force utility customers to avail themselves of energy savings. Uh, uh, as a voluntary program, we are required by law to make a cost-effective program. So yeah, in, in the perfect world, maybe we could add some cash incentives for uh, getting people to save money, but, but that's, that's, that wouldn't fall under the cost-effective test. So we provide a variety of new programs. Um, it if you think this is not successful for SMUD, uh, they give out in just one program 600 uh, refrigerators a year to low-income folks. Uh, Los Angeles LEDWP, uh, that's 7,000. Th these products get out there, and to achieve that 1% is an aggressive target already. Uh, I'd like to make just a brief comment in response to the gentleman in support of the bill who mentioned the state of Massachusetts. I don't know if the state of Massachusetts has been at the forefront of energy efficiency since the 1970s as, as California has. Uh, by virtue of our own processes and the California Energy Commission, uh, we, we have done leaps and bounds compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, 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 secondly, I don't know if Massachusetts is served by uh, almost 50 utilities, three of them IOUs compelled by the CPUC to spend billions of dollars on energy efficiency. I believe my members, my local utilities are, are doing in leaps and bounds trying to achieve the highest level of efficiencies currently under the current processes. They are cost effective and conform to the state's uh, uh, loading order where we try to do cost effective, reliable, techni technologically feasible, cost effective programs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Kira Ross on behalf of the cities of Pasadena, Burbank and Riverside, all we would echo CMUA's comments all in opposition to the bill. Mr. Chairman, members, Will Gonzalez on behalf of the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. I would just like to say it is one thing for the state to uh, impose a renewable portfolio standard. That's something a utility can go out, they can buy, and they can make the, they can make the, hit the goal of 20%, 33%. 
here, no matter how much money the utility spends, we, we, we can't drive the behavior, we can't force the savings on the customer. You're, you're holding the utilities to a standard that ultimately is gonna be, at the end, the, the behavior of the customer. So for that reason, we oppose. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Valerie Torello Vlahos with uh, Pacific Gas and Electric Company. Um, associate myself with the previous comments made by my colleagues, and just would add that um, we don't we see the current target setting process um, mentioned in the testimony as very rigorous um, and very aggressive. Um, Mary, uh, sorry, joining what is technically potential, what's the market potential, um, and sorry and what, the, of course, the economic potential is. And so we don't see that process as broken. We think that process should continue. And um, for our other reasons stated, we oppose the bill. Mr. Chair, members, Cindy Howe with Southern California Edison. And unfortunately, we also oppose the bill for the reasons already stated. Thank you. Tamara Raspberry on behalf of San Diego Gas and Electric. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to speak against the bill. We do oppose the bill. We support cost-effective energy efficiency programs based on expert input and market studies to set appropriate targets. We do not think this bill um, meets that standard. Um, that target should only be established through a regulatory proceeding with the full benefit of economic analysis and stakeholder input. And for these reasons, we are opposed. Thank you. And we also agree with the comments made earlier. Mr. Chairman, members, Jack Walco with the Gualco Group on behalf of the Imperial Irrigation District and uh, IID is also in opposition. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, again, I wanted to uh, revisit the uh, amendments. The amendments are very specific. The language was added to the bill. Are you accepting the amendments? Absolutely, yes. Okay, great. Just want to make that clear. Understood. Did you want to uh, close, maybe in your close, if you can respond if you can respond to some of the concerns. Uh, did we have anything from the committee? Thank you. Okay, before we do go to you on that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Assembly Member. It's good to see you, sir. Uh, just a quick question on this, and, and coming from uh, a municipal background when it comes to power, in, try, in having significant penetration when it comes to uh, both energy efficiency appliances as well as solar, uh, it, it is all on a voluntary front. Trying to be able to compel those uh, that may not otherwise be willing by doubling the demand, if you will. Uh, talk about that, because that is going to be a bit of a challenge, whether you're, you are a municipal or one of the legacy, like a PG&E or SoCal Edison. Well, there's protections built into the bill. What, what the bill does is, is it sets a goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if the, if the goal simply can't be met, there are off-ramps and there are other protections built in for utilities. So, um, I, Mr. Schiller, yeah. did you have any? Yeah, uh, well, thank you. I think you know, it's, a, it's a point very important. I'm glad you raised that question. The, the way we look at it is two ways. One is that it's actually providing the opportunity for more uh, consumers who are paying for this, and the second is accountability, because there is money going to the utilities to achieve this and to make sure it's accountable. We do have a number of utilities in the state that are already uh, meeting or approaching, certainly yeah. uh, the uh, 2020 goals, um, and we see this as viable. The, the numbers indicate that it's economically viable to do this. And so we are looking for a bit of a push, but it's about accountability, it's about providing opportunity, and it's doing something that sets a floor that you know some utilities in the state are already show they can achieve. And it's not only Massachusetts, it's states like Arizona who are also doing this. So uh, it, it is gonna be tough, but we need to do this if we're gonna be looking at doubling our efficiency goals. And this provides a vehicle that provides accountability and pushing for the utilities to achieve it. And don't get me wrong, I think you're absolutely right on, on train trying to be able to push out these dollars and put them to work, right? Because it's uh, obviously uh, good for the environment and it's good for our economy uh, as we see folks doing energy efficient upgrades in homes and businesses. I think the only challenge is it's compelling those individuals since it is a voluntary program and how that works. And so I just, um, can you go into the Arizona program just a bit on how they've been able to increase their capacity, if you will, uh, for residents, business owners um, seeking energy efficiency upgrades? Well, I think it's, it's not only Arizona, but it's actually within the state too. And so there are a number of things that you know, provide that 
the, again, that opportunity. You know, one is the increase in PACE programs and the availability of financing. So it's something well, that this legislature. I, I come from the county of Sonoma, uh, where we've been absolutely hosed uh, when it comes to our PACE program because of the feds. So I, I just, I'm careful about going there because uh, of Fannie and Freddie. But that's just well, an the, editorial the pace, and a very- Things are changing with those PACE programs and as well as with the financing opportunities uh, there. But, you know, the, I get your point. I mean, these programs, you know, have pluses and minuses and sometimes they work well and some they don't. But there's an increasing number of, of different opportunities. The general category, I think, of providing financing. There's also the work through AB 758 that the state's working on, the plan there for making efficiency more visible by doing disclosure and labeling of buildings provides that opportunities. And we're all, frankly, we're all getting smarter at the ability to do this. Another aspect actually too is 802, which I think one of the uh, folks uh, mentioned here earlier in that, you know, that's looking at changing at the way in which uh, the baselines that are determined for these programs. So that uh, could open up some number of opportunities. I think what we're saying here with this bill is if you're gonna be looking at doing things like changing the baseline, going into that technical detail, which the commissions usually handle, and, and changing the basis on which you determine the savings, that there needs to be there with a flip side to actually have the accountability and actual target. So we, we look at those in working together. And uh, there's a number of things that need to be done. And I think that I actually am encouraged by the work that our utilities, public and private, have been doing in the state. We just see that looking at the numbers, it's economically viable, we can do more achievable, and it's, and it's gonna take an effort of all of us. But we think we need that push from this reasonable goal. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I do want thank to you. thank you to the member for uh, his stance on this and, and many others. So it's good to see you, sir. Thank you. you want to close? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, this bill does not mandate how utilities achieve the goals of energy efficiency. It recognizes that the governor has asked us to uh, jump further and to achieve more. In order to do that, the best way is for the legislature rather than the PUC to take hold of this program, which uh, at this time involves already a billion dollars in ratepayer money, uh, and make sure that utilities are held accountable for maximizing the efficiency benefit of those dollars. And I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll ask for a motion on that bill when we reach a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we'll ask. Thank you.